welcome to Awake Ones. I'm Alexandra Wenman. I'm Noreen Flaherty. And I'm Sally Points at Nash. And today we're going to be talking to you about nature. So, Sally, do you want to start us off? What are your thoughts and feelings about nature? I love nature. Um, I grew up in, we're obviously filming this in London in the UK, and I grew up in the countryside. And I was down there for about five, six years. So for me, I love a city, but I also absolutely love being in nature. I find it realigns me, it grounds me. You know, I, I'm at my happiest in the countryside, although I do love the buzz of a big city. And do you find that you have to be back in nature quite often? Is there a certain kind of time period that you get to when you feel like you have to escape mm. back there? Yeah, I don't think there's any kind of rigid time frame, but you just get that pull. It's like, I've got to go, I've got to go be in nature. I mean, where I live in London, it's pretty green, so I can get out into greenery, but to get away to the countryside and that clean air, the quietness, in London there's always a noise. Mm. Um, that, it, I mean, it has to happen at least four times a year. Mm. And what kind of, fit, I'm always interested in the, like the healing power of nature and the, the sort of physiological effects that it has on you. So from your personal experience, what's the, what sort of happens to you on a personal level physiologically when you're in nature? For me, I just, I don't feel so supercharged like I am in the city and I feel more myself. I don't feel the need to straighten my hair when I'm in nature, you know, just, I haven't felt the need to straighten my hair today. Um, but you know, it's just, I don't really care what I look like. It's more about being outside. I love it when it rains mm -hmm. in nature, whereas in the city, you know, it's shrieking and, and reaching for an umbrella. Um, I, I just think you care less about your outward appearance and it's more about spending time in nature and just, you know, I'll often take my shoes off. I'm the guy that goes swimming on a, a New Year's Eve in a freezing cold ocean. Um, yeah, you know, just immersing yourself completely. And then when you're in nature for a while, do you ever feel, can you ever feel overwhelmed by being in nature and need to escape back to the city afterwards or is it more just needs must? I think I love extremes, so, mm. you know, I, I wouldn't say it's overwhelm, but I always enjoy coming back to the city. Mm. Um, I think because I live where I live and it's quite a green part of the city, I don't know if I lived in, like, a concrete jungle version of the city, mm. whether I'd feel differently. But, um, yeah, it's got to be a balance of both. Yeah, the balance, isn't it? I think too much of a good thing, right? Yeah, um, definitely. But also the ocean, and, mm. you know, not that close to the ocean here but used to live in California, um, right by the ocean, and that's amazing. Mm. I think I'd choose ocean yeah. over most other things. I'm definitely ocean girl. How about you, Lorraine? Yeah, I am born and raised in the city, but very conscious that my family, both my mum and dad, both grew up in Ireland and were both fairly... My dad was right by the ocean, and my mum's house where she grew up was about a mile away from the ocean but it was also a mile away from any other houses so it was just completely countryside and fields there was nothing else around and I do have a hankering and it, it seems to get stronger as I get older just the the need to be outside and yeah any time when I actually get to stay especially there's something about sleeping overnight in nature whether it's the desert or whether it's near the ocean or whether it's in a forest or wherever it is, just that idea of being that close and that connected to just the earth and not having kind of concrete over me. And I joke a lot about having gypsy blood, mm. but I just think there is something very powerful about that idea of living in connection with the earth. I and mean, we even stayed we stayed in a gypsy caravan for a couple of nights and it was anywhere we go any excuse yeah whether it's <laughs> a tree house which I, st I stayed in a tree house when i was in uh, california a few years ago and i mean it literally was just a box that was hanging over the vineyards near um uh, what's the wine country napa valley mm. and uh i mean i was just <laughs> beside myself with with happiness so very basic even if there's no amenities, and again, sorry, it's probably more information than people need, but just the thing of peeing outside, <laughs> there's just something, I don't know, it's almost that primal, just not needing all of the mm. things that 
civilization has kind of built around us and locked us in. Mm. There's a need for that freedom. Have you ever showered in the open air? What, one of my, our friend Andrea at her house, there's an open yeah. air shower in Ibiza. Hot sunshine and you get up in the morning and you're just overlooking a field. No one can see you and yeah. you're just there. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just think any any connection that you have, and I grew up camping as well, so mm. uh, most of my early holidays were down in Devon and Cornwall. And it was that same thing. It was that freedom to just park up because we had a camper van and we would literally just go wherever. Mm. The rules are different now about parking back then. You didn't have to pay for every place mm. that you stayed in. I think Devon and Cornwall still pretty much Is the it? same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of it. But to just drive and then find a place that you thought was absolutely beautiful and then just pitch up and just stay there. Mm. And then just magical waking up in the morning and just birds and animals and just the sounds of nature although actually that's the one thing I think we think the city is noisy cue the tube going yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but I think some of the noisiest places that I've ever been to have been yeah. the places in nature where you just get all the, the the birds and the animal sounds but there's something really magical and uh, just comforting about that mm. Mm. well I grew up in Australia and <laughs> You can't get nature much more extreme, I think, than than growing up there. The sky, for a start, is like the biggest sky you'll ever see. It's like people people always say, "Oh, what's so good about Australia?" And then I'm like, "Just get there. Just get there and yeah. see the sky because you don't get nowhere else in the world, not even in um, South America, have I seen sky and stars like I've seen in Australia, especially in the Aussie desert, um, that beautiful red desert." But I grew up. In uh, on like 10 acres of land by the sea, you know, I had beach, I had trees, I had creatures. I was the one that was always making friends with beetles and I probably would have brought home spiders if my parents didn't have a chart on the fridge saying, don't go near any of these because they'll kill you. Um, but I always came home with animals like stray cats and I rescued a duckling from the school agriculture department and all that stuff. But I remember you know, being completely immersed in nature as a child and being in amongst the trees and, and having my own little rockery and planting flowers and, and actually talking to the trees, like actually feeling the presence of them. And and I kind of closed that down for a while and it reopened again. It's really reawakened now. And as an adult, I find that it's such a tonic, being being by the sea, being by the trees, being in the woods, being in the desert, wherever it is. It's so It's such a tonic. So, <laughs> I got blank. Alice lost for words. <laughs> no, I think we should keep it. That has never happened. I've never been lost this for is words. very rare. <laughs> she just went off into nature. <laughs> I think I went off into nature. I think there is there's too much about it. Like, how do we? How do we? You can't really hone it down because it's it's so medicinal. It's so healing. It's mm. so therapeutic. It's so vast. And there are so many different components to it. Yeah. So what's your what's your favourite thing about nature? What's your favourite element of nature? I mean, being in it is my favourite bit. But I think where... I love the fact where something that can kill you is right next to something that can heal you. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, that plant medicine way of thinking. And even um, when we went to Kew Gardens, they've got the medicinal gardens there. Yeah. Um, at the at Kew Palace and it's everything that can kill you next to something that can heal you so I, I think you know seeing that in nature and just being absorbed in it you realize how, no, it's not just healing to you and your soul by being in it mm -hmm. um, it can actually heal you yeah. by using what's in nature mm -hmm. yeah I remember Literally. going on long bike rides as a kid not really planning <laughs> for the distance that I was going to cover and just eating primroses but always picking the primroses from the top of the bank. <laughs> not, yeah. not eating the primroses from the bottom. Of the bank. Um, and yeah, just it berries from hedgerows. And it, I just didn't really think about, oh, I'm going on a 26 mile bike yeah. ride. Maybe I should take a sandwich. Just yeah. eating stuff from nature. Yeah. And yeah. That, yeah, there was something really incredible as well about just, especially we used to go collecting blackberries mm. when I was younger. And that used to be my favourite thing to do. We'd go we out on a Sunday afternoon with a couple of buckets and just go out into the countryside and nature's harvest there's nothing more magical mm. than just having things mm. provided 
in that way. Yeah, just amazing. And I remember staying with a friend in France and waking up in the morning and she said, oh, can you just pop outside and you know, grab some raspberries and mm. some strawberries for breakfast? Mm. And they just, I don't know, everything just tastes more amazing when it's... Mm. Even in London, like even in the city, you can go. We went blackberry picking last weekend, me and hubby, just along the New yeah. River. We just went out for a walk, took a little bucket, and they went, and um, yeah, they were blackberry ice cream, nothing better. <laughs> but I love the power of nature, the sheer power of it, and the unpredictability of it, especially when you're by the sea or in the sea, and the, the, the changeability of it. And then you realise that you're, you're only human, <laughs> you know. We think that we can harness it we think that we can control it we think that we've got this all sorted and then you know things like tsunamis and earthquakes happen and we're just a little speck really on this big rolling rock through space yeah. so it's like that mother nature the sheer force of her and then it reminds you that everything has to be in balance and that if you do honor the cycles and the rhythms of nature and and it's like don't get too big for your boots because then the rug always it you know comes out from under you proverbially i just love the sea i love the way that the sea can be calm one moment and then huge storms can roll in the next when i was a kid we used to have a i don't know why my mother sold that house i loved that house i grew up in this house and we had windows overlooking the sea we were up on a hill and you had beautiful sea views and i remember in thunderstorms just pressing my nose up against the glass and watching the storm and the electricity for hours and hours and hours just magical mm. My grandma was, she lived in the, in the countryside and she was very much that a garden to kitchen table. I think she's about 90% sustainable from her own land. And I've just thought about it as we're filming this, but she wrote a poem um, which was all about the wildlife in her garden and the wildlife at her house. So I think if we can pause at the end of this and then I'll go grab the poem and just yeah. read that to close with. Yeah, oh, that would be, be that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, my grandparents were the same. My grandfather had a big field at the back of the house. And again as a child, so much excitement when he would just say, Right, what what should we have for dinner? And then to just go up with a with a bucket and a little spade and then pick up the potatoes and all the different root vegetables and everything that we wanted everything was just there it just felt like such a gift and I think that's part of the thing that we've lost in a lot of ways because I, you know we're talking about nature as a, a healing force nature has this sense of balance and I think provides what we need when we need it as we need it mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the reason why many people are having kind of nutritional problems is because we've started to mess with the, the the seasons we're not you know the hunter gatherers would eat what nature provided mm. at the time so winter was root vegetables you know summer tended to be more berries and fruits and i think we've lost that we've become and it's wonderful that we can have anything that we want at any time of the year but i don't think it works mm. with our bodies with the the natural flow i think we've lost that that sense of yeah, just, just working in alignment with it. I mean, I, I was going to buy some strawberries coming over here and I picked them up and the inside of the strawberries was white, which mm. is what usually happens when they're out of season. They're not actually red right mm. the way through because they've been grown in greenhouses, which may not have even been in this country, and therefore they don't actually taste of anything. And I, I now, on principle, will not eat strawberries when it's mm. not strawberry season. I'm really trying to eat what is kind of grown mm. and what is natural to that moment in time I think our bodies are just not designed and then we've got the whole GM question yeah. don't we the whole genetically yeah. modified messing with nature messing with is it. just yeah. not a good idea and I think it is if you like, not the GM part but if you live in Alaska yeah you know, <laughs> if you live in Alaska yeah. then yeah you're not going to probably have a very balanced diet as far as the vegetables and eat a lot of fish the, yeah <laughs> fish yeah. Um, but yeah I think you know it is good that we are able to get food from mm. other places that yeah. grow in different seasons um just not wrapped in plastic and genetically modified I know, exactly exactly <laughs> we've lost, so yeah we've kind everything of lost everything in balance but even working with um with a nutritionist and she said that because i was eating loads of raw spinach had cravings for it and she told me that i really shouldn't be in raw greens like that in the sun for my system anyway because the 
the enzymes or whatever mm. the body produces in the winter months is different to what it produces right. in the summer months mm. when it's hot. And so she said, you're basically creating a compost heap or a in compost pile yeah. inside your body. And I would kind of get gripes. So I would, I would eat all these raw salads thinking I was being really healthy and then feel terrible afterwards and not understand why. And it made complete sense. I've stopped doing it now in the winter. Mm. So I'll only have raw greens and, and raw leaves and stuff in the summer now. And it does seem to have helped. Mm, I know it's my favourite food though I love a crunchy salad yeah it's yeah brilliant. but working with what nature is mm. providing really it's such a shame that more of us don't have space to have our own our own gardens and provide or produce our own food mm. you know, back in the day when there were allotments or you know people had their own small little little gardens to do that Mm. and then we wouldn't need the huge big supermarkets and then mm. we wouldn't need the huge big overproduction and we wouldn't need things to be yeah. genetically modified I think mm. we should work with nature far more it's very energetically healing as well if there's ever ne negative energy around mm. if you're in nature it just naturally raises your vibration yeah. doesn't it? it makes you feel better, more joyful you've got more oxygen you've got more of the, the, the positive ions in the air um, they also say like if there's any if you have any kind of negative energies in your energy field if you cross flowing water mm. it, it it will negate or hug a tree or hug a tree hug a tree send it into the, the tree trees. trees will absorb it and transmute it yeah I think we're all tree huggers here aren't we yeah yeah <laughs> well, I want to hear this squishy time. um squishy redwood squishy oh, redwood. They're all, redwoods are really squishy oh god you can't get your arms around a redwood really <laughs> you can't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a mere sampling for you, though, isn't it? Yeah, so? <laughs> not the full brain ones, even I'd struggle. <laughs> yeah, they're so beautiful. I love eucalyptus. Anything about eucalyptus is my favourite tree. So it smells good. You can bathe in it. It's zesty and vibrant. And it has so many different medicinal properties. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. What's your favourite tree? I don't know. I was just thinking that. Maybe it would be an oak, I think. Mm. I think I'm quite partial to a good oak tree. Well, on the redwoods, they make me feel tiny. And I love a magical yew tree as well. Oh, well, let's see, look, yew or eucalyptus? Because <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> but favourite, so what would be your absolute favourite kind of natural location? Then? If you had to pick whether it was desert or beach. Oh, or God, or if I had to pick one... It was it was tough because when we were in the desert in Egypt, and and it's always been to me the desert is sheer poetry and I love it so much and it's just so beautiful and I know that I've had many past lives um, in the Sahara Desert, but if I had to pick one, it would be the ocean definitely because I grew up by the sea and yeah yeah ocean for me ocean. yeah I think I'd be really I'm I'd really struggle yeah <laughs> <laughs> I would really struggle to to choose between the two but I do know that. Something, something shifts in me when I'm in the desert. Mm -hmm. Something lights up, and I feel mm -hmm. so euphoric in the desert. So as much as I love the ocean, I think mm -hmm. I would. I'd have to go for the desert. I think. Are you going to move to the desert? I don't know. Send us a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I could have the desert, well, in fact, actually, the perfect location I think was when I was in. It was just up from Dahab, so past mm -hmm. Nueva. There's a little bit in between Nueva and um, Taba, kind of almost the Israeli border, where uh, a friend had a camp, and it was that we did a we did a retreat in, and it was bamboo huts on the beach, mm. and then nothing, no, there's no shops, there's no uh, no other buildings whatsoever, and then behind the camp was a, a small mountain range, not not massive, but bigger than a hill, and then you went over the other side of that, and you were straight into the desert. So that as a location was just bliss. That could, was could you live there though? Could you could you base yourself? I there? Could, well potentially. I mean, I could spend. I don't think I could be there forever because, mm. like you said, you need the mm. stimulation. Sometimes mm. I need to come back, and I need the city, and I need busy, and I need frantic because that's mm. what I've grown up being used to. But I could certainly spend quite a lot of time mm. in that environment for sure. I think it's the human contact too, isn't yeah. it? Like. Even though I, you know, when it's busy and there's so many people around, it's like, oh, I need to, you know, especially as empaths, we kind of need to, yeah. you know, step away for a minute. But I think if I'm, you know, if I was in nature all the time and isolated and alone, I yeah. would really not, not enjoy it because it's human nature to, 
enjoy each other's company too. Yeah, exactly. So that location with just all of my favourite people. <laughs> On Skype. <laughs> One day I would just put you all in my suitcase and we'll all go to Australia. It will be fabulous. <laughs> I promise to like telepathically ask all the spiders and snakes to stay away. Yeah, that's the only thing. <laughs> Though I have made my peace with spiders, but I'm not sure. Spiders are great. Yeah, spiders I know. Are great. I, know. Like I did have a phobia, are. but I, it was it was fixed on my NLP practitioner. You don't want to cuddle ago. up to a funnel web, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Or those flesh-eating ones that we found oh, in Joshua Tree. Oh, the brown so the brown No, we are not making friends with those, thanks very much. Yeah, well, but as long as they're not in your them, bed, yeah. um, then, you know, spiders are great. Yeah, yeah. They are. they're wonderful. No, I'm, I have a love, I have a love affair with spiders now. Mm. Yeah. Don't squash spiders. My, no, my garden's been overrun with spiders this year. Well, spiders are great. What? They eat all the flies. They've they been, eat all the stuff um, that's... Mini microcosm of like this amazing magical garden in my garden we've got spiders everywhere like so many spiders this year but lots of bees and butterflies have come mm. this year i don't know there's something magical about this summer there's a mm. lot of uh, little creatures ladybirds beetles and things around and loads of grasshoppers yeah which is really yeah. Yeah. yeah i had a really beautiful pale green one mm. turn up in my flat the other day and it was gorgeous a grasshopper. <laughs> grasshopper. <laughs> anyway, what movie was that? I, I want to hear this poem. Shall we get yeah. this yes. poem? So let's... Okay, we're going to pause for a minute. We're back. I'm just cleaning my reading glass. <laughs> <laughs> so Sal's going to read us a poem. Oh, story time! <laughs> <laughs> so this is from my grandma. She wrote it in 1994. Um, and she lived in a house called Kingsmead. And the poem's called The Wildlife of Kingsmead. I've read this, I think, haven't I? I sent it to yeah, you. Yeah. It's beautiful. Alan loves a bit of poetry. Mm -hmm. Around my house, up on the hill, a wealth of wildlife stop. At the back of the house, there's a lush green field with a good thick hedge on top. This is where the rabbits play in the early morning sun. At the slightest sound, they stop, look around and decide that it's time to run. At the end of the drive is a raised island bed where all kinds of birds come down to be fed. Some feed on the table, some feed on the ground. All make for the trees when the spirit squirrels come around. There are blue tits and great tits, cold tits as well, crested and willow tits and tits with long tails, wrens, robins, finches and magpies in twos, blackbirds, thrushes and flycatchers, nuthatches come too. A great spotted woodpecker with a rear end bright red, the green woodpecker's laughing call goes right through your head. At the end of the house are the stables and in spring, when the weather turns warm, the swallows will fly in. Build their nest in the gables and high in the eaves. When the babies hatch out, they're protective of these. If while you are working, you dare to go near, you're dive-bombed by the parents until you stand clear. Through a gate is the orchard, a haven for bees. Starlings and sparrows perch high in the trees. In the far corner is a bin full of leaves, and that is the home for worms, beetles, hoverflies and fleas. <laughs> Mice live in the woodshed among bean sticks and poles, and there are holes made by foxes and mounds made by moles. Ahead is the water garden, in two ponds you will see. Water boatmen, water beetles, water snails and water fleas. <laughs> in the plants round the edge, frogs and toads lie in wait for any poor creature to make a mistake. Damsel and dragonflies dance on the water with ease. When the wings get tired, they're weak at the knees. They land on the lily leaves, and methinks there is no better place than this to take 40 winks. The best time of all at the ponds is in spring, when the frogs from all over decide to come in. When mating's completed, spawn covers the water. The tadpoles hatch out, and sooner or later, baby frogs by the hundred are seeking safe shelter. There's a field in the front with a barn in the corner. A little owl lives there and we just adore her. She swoops low over the ground, comes to rest on the fence yonder. I stand at the field gate and in deep thought I wonder, are there any field mice left for this little owl to plunder? We take a rest at the side of the lane where tall pine trees and oaks grow and it's plain. They give home to the squirrels, jackdaws, collared doves and crows and sweet-scented shrubs attract butterflies in droves. When the time comes to leave my home, it will be for a bungalow in town or a place by the sea. 
My body may be there, but my heart will always be at Kingsmead, high on the hill, in my beloved West Country. Oh, that's so lovely. Amazing, right? That's so beautiful. You can really visualise. Yeah. yeah. You're a beautiful writer. Amazing. Although that reminds me of magpies. Because mm. I'm very rarely superstitious about anything. But I do have that thing when you see one magpie. I mean, she mentioned magpies oh. in twos. Because oh. oh. it's one for sorrow. One for joy. Yeah, but I always change superstitions so, like that. I go, I one for joy, two for joy. Yes, exactly. That's what I do now. Instead <laughs> of one for sorrow, I change the wording. Yeah. yeah. One for joy, two for double joy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to be stuck with any exactly. silly superstitions, but that's exactly. so beautiful. Does it make you feel a bit emotional reading that? Mm, not now. No. Mm. I mean, my grandma died when I was 21, and I'm now 40, um, and it just, it's nostalgic now. Yeah. It's, you know, I spent a lot of time in that house growing up. I know exactly where she's talking about. I know the owl she's talking about. Um, they even had a pheasant called Henry, Aww. which in the countryside, you don't tell people you're Henry. feeding and, and housing a pheasant that's not going to get shot because <gasps> it's living for 6pm every day where frozen sweet corn comes flying out the window. <laughs> mm. um, so, yeah, it was just their whole environment, their setup, the whole thing was about nature. Yeah, um, so good. It's like a mini spring watch, that, reading that poem. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, gorgeous. Pretty much covers everything. I don't know because the screen's gone off. I don't know if, if she's in the picture, but that's her up there on the wall. Oh, oh in the wedding dress. Yeah, with all the flowers yeah. and look at the big nature in yeah. her hands. <laughs> yeah, it's literally a forest. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, it's so cute. Thanks for sharing that. That's okay. Yeah, thank beautiful. you. Beautiful. Yes, well, we would love to know about you guys and nature. What are your thoughts on nature? What do you feel? We'd love to see your comments below. What's um, your favourite place? What's your favourite tree? What's, favorite your... Tree? Yeah. <laughs> What's your favourite animal? All sorts. And we probably could do a million shows on this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just to um, also invite you to share any ideas for topics that you'd like us to talk about on the Awake Ones show. And, uh, yeah, again, please... Uh, Comment below, subscribe for more, join our Facebook group, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> we are, we're building a community here and um, we just want to share our love for all things, for all people, for all places, everything spiritual, natural, conscious. Anyway, I'm rambling now. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but one minute I go blank, the next minute I'm rambling. So thank you all so much for watching Awake Ones. Thank you for watching.